it's always very difficult to speak after Jean-Pascal Van Iperzeel, which I have been doing a few times. Um, so, so important and so well said. I would, I would be delighted to just trade off my, my own uh, speaking time for, for, for his um, and, and allow him to say a bit more. Let me, however, try to relate um, what Jean-Pascal Van Iperzeel just said to the questions that are dear to this audience, and uh, essentially three questions. First, um, how to think about the transition to a low-carbon society? Um, second, how does this relate to governance in the EU? And thirdly, how does this relate to social justice? And I know that this is an issue, the third question that um, uh, Benjamin, Denis, and, and Eloi Laurent shall, shall also be discussing, and probably Nadine Gouzet will discuss the first question at greater depth. Um, let me perhaps begin with the, the third question, uh, to propose that maybe um, the EU is now confronted with a dual challenge, the difficulty being to combine both. First, it has to very clearly rethink its model of growth. Um, growth, as usual, is increasingly seen as unsustainable, and it um, results in a huge depletion of resources, it results in considerable amounts of waste, um, emissions of greenhouse gases are one subcategory of waste, um, and in fact, the only reason why the EU today can pretend to comply with the commitments it has under the Kyoto Protocol in particular has to do with the fact that it imports what is produced uh, with high levels of emissions. And this inconsistency is very striking to me. Uh, the way the commitments under the Kyoto Protocol are calculated do not take into account the, um, uh, the consumption of goods produced elsewhere. They only take into account um, uh, the emissions in particular geographical regions. And so it seems to me that the current trajectory um, as exemplary as the EU presents itself to be, is entirely unsustainable. The second challenge, however, is to think about social protection. And we know here what the essential difficulties are. We have um, um, a deindustrialization in Europe, a shift from industry to services. We have a very rapid pace of ch technological innovation so that the skills of workers are rapidly being depleted. And we have uh, an increased life expectancy as well, as well as low fertility rates so that our systems of social security, the fiscal sustainability of social security um, um, is extremely uh, precarious. And so we need to redefine our models of social protection um, at the same time and we need to combine the ecological transition with the social transition. Now, if that is the challenge, um, it seems to me there are essentially three shifts over which there is broad agreement that can contribute to meeting these two goals simultaneously. And there's a, th a fourth shift which is perhaps more controversial, but which I would also like to propose uh, for a discussion. The first shift over which there is agreement is that the macroeconomic policies, um, such as today constitutionalized in, through the Treaty on Stability, Coordination and Governance, um, should be rethought to be made compatible with the social and eco ecological transition. For the moment, there is no such link at all. And I think it's a first problem, but at least there's agreement, broad agreement on the fact that there is a problem with the um, way the European semester functions, the way the budgetary discussions take place, um, and whether those are compatible with the two challenges I presented. A second shift, um, is to move towards a different measure of success. Um, GDP per capita has, is still the primary motivation that policymakers have in mind when making choices. Um, and the European Commission has published a few communications on how to calculate progress beyond GDP. Um, but uh, those have not really influenced um, the shaping of policies. Um, yet we should realize that GDP per capita is not, has not always been guiding public policies. It actually is a measure that appeared in the mid-1940s, and it has many advantages. It is simple, it is comfortable, allow us, allowing us not to think about lifestyle changes and, and about sharing the burden of sacrifice. It is politically popular because it is a way to 
not have to think about redistribution. The idea is that if you promote economic growth, all boats will be lifted with the rising tide, and as a result, there will be no need for substantive redistributive policies. Yet, it makes no sense anymore to take GDP per capita as a measure of progress. We know, this is the Easterlin paradox, right? We know that it is unrelated beyond certain levels of affluence to happiness, to well-being, to health, and that, um, in fact, um, uh, policy should be guided by other considerations than growth um, in our affluent uh, rich countries. Mm -hmm. um, and that is the second challenge. I think EU 2020 goes one, a few steps towards defining something else, but it still is um, extremely uh, problematic to see the weight that economic growth has in shaping, uh, shaping policies. A third shift over which there is, there is an agreement is the need to put equality at the heart of social and economic policies. There are a number of reasons to do this. First, um, um, in more equal societies, there is less um, desire of people to um, match the status that others have achieved by their levels of consumption. Right? We know that much of our consumption is not driven by needs, uh, but in other terms, by the satisfaction of basic needs. It is driven by the desire to be seen by others as you know, part of the same class. And it is what Veblen called conspicuous consumption. And more equal societies have less of this happening. Um, secondly, the more equal the society is, the more growth will have poverty-reducing impacts. Formulated thus, it's almost tautological. But you understand, of course, that in unequal societies, and they are becoming, in all OECD countries, more unequal by the day, in more unequal societies, you need much more growth to improve the lot of the poorest uh, uh, within society. And this results, of course, in greater environmental destru destruction um, um, as a price to pay for the reduction of poverty. Um, thirdly, um, the more equal a society is, the easiest it will be to shift to more sober lifestyles that are part of the transition that we need. And I note that the um, Intergovernmental Panel of Experts on Climate Change identify lifestyle changes, right, behavioral changes as part of the mix of solutions we need to strive towards. Well, this is easier to do in, in more equal societies because the sacrifices will be more fairly, more equitably shared. There's a fourth shift, which is more controversial, which I will not detail here, but we may discuss this in the questions if, we, if, if there's a, a willingness to do so. And the fourth shift is to link trade policies, access to markets, to environmental and social conditions. Um, a few months ago, I, I, I finalized a report that was actually commissioned by the Minister of uh, Sustainable Development for the Walloon region, then Jean-Marc Nollet. And the report was about whether international law, particularly um, WTO law, allows the EU to use its economic might the attractiveness of its markets um, in order to impose conditions on access to markets and to use trade policies as a tool for the social and ecological transition. And I think it is really not acceptable anymore that um, we consider those two issues separately. I very much hope that Connie Hedegaard, in her new uh, capacity uh, as um, uh, trade commissioner for the, for the EU, shall um, be serious about um, um, uh, linking climate change in particular to trade policies. Beyond those shifts, however, um, there is, I think, um, um, a need to recognize that we do not know what the solutions exactly are. And we must accept that given the complexity of the social and ecological transition that we must achieve, um, maybe the good departure point is to accept that we do not know exactly what recipes will succeed. And to, more, to be more precise, there are three reasons for this uncertainty. One is the pace of change, economic change, technological change, environmental change, um, making it very difficult for societies to cope in this dynamic context in which these different elements are interrelated. Um, secondly, there is across the EU a huge diversity um, 
not least as a result of enlargement, uh, but even within countries, there is lots of diversity. And we have therefore lost faith in uniform solutions imposed top down that neglect, negate, or are oblivious of this diversity. That's the second point. Pace of change, diversity across the EU. And thirdly, there is the limits, I think, of top-down approaches. Um, you see, in the past, governments always used two tools to change things. They used um, regulation, prohibiting certain things and authorizing others, and they used economic incentives, taxes, subsidies. Um, the internalization of negative externalities. But these tools have been limited in their ability to effectuate behavioral change. Why is that? Well, social psychologists, particularly um, uh, Richard Ryan, Edward Dickey, and the self-determination theory associated with these authors, teach us that people actually change their behavior once they do this, not because they are constrained, but because they believe it is the right thing to do, because they have certain values they cherish, because they have children they want to preserve the world for, and because they believe um, it is the image of themselves they wish to project to the outside world. Um, so maybe, although we should continue to regulate and, and, and use economic incentives, of course, maybe we should also try to understand how we could stimulate the development of innovative solutions that are bottom-up, tailored to the local context, using local resources, basically um, trying to tap the huge potential of what is now happening in Brussels, in Belgium, in Europe, and indeed elsewhere, uh, to change society towards um, a low-carbon society. And this is why the question of governance is central. Um, the problem is not, it seems to me, simply that our current models of governance are, are inappropriate. The problem is that we still reason as if there was one model that we should apply to reality, to social society. In fact, we have no model, we have no blueprint. Um, we have no one right way of doing things. And perhaps we should see transition in a very different light um, as the need to stimulate local experimentation, to accelerate the search for answers to questions such as how to promote active aging, how to best reconcile family and professional life, how to reduce the ecological footprint in our ways of moving, of eating, um, of producing and consuming. Maybe we should link these experiments to one another to ensure that the best practices can be disseminated, scaled out from place to place. Maybe we should reshape policies at a higher level of governance in order to remove the obstacles to the most promising experiments developing and, and growing. Um, this, I think, is one way of thinking about transition that we have not explored sufficiently in the way we think about the role of the EU in achieving together the social and ecological transition. It would mean um, leaving um, a broad freedom to experiment to the subunits, the member states and regions within the EU, and indeed the municipalities, the cities. It would mean setting certain broad objectives, but allowing those subunits to identify the means by which to make progress towards these objectives, with a duty to report back as to the progress achieved. It would mean learning collectively about uh, or from the experiments that have um, best succeeded. Now, you may think this is um, theoretical and this is the result of you know, some, some sort of um, um, utopian view of how the ecological transition could develop in the future, but in fact not. It is what is happening today in the streets and in the municipalities in many places of the EU. Um, as described, for example, in the transition movement that was launched in 2006 in Totnes, this town in the UK uh, uh, under the leadership of Rob Hopkins and the Transition Towns Movement. Um, and I, I would suggest that social innovations as promoted by such movements have been insufficiently recognized in their potential to achieve change. Um, and my insistence on those social innovations is um, driven by four considerations. One, it is the best way to move away from the current economic model and to move not just towards 
technical solutions such as the circular economy, right? Recycling waste and trying to um, um, reuse waste in order to reduce our ecological footprint, um, or the functional economy in which we move from um, owning stuff to using the services that that stuff may provide, such as when we share cars or bicycles. Um, it also is the best way to move to the shared economy, collaborative modes of consumption that can um, um, allow us to have lifestyles that are very comfortable, um, hardly changed from the present um, situation, but um, sharing much more with others um, and, and developing um, uh, tools to do so um, in order to, uh, to change our economic paradigm. There are many groups today working on this, and one of the leaders in this discussion is Michel Bowens uh, uh, with his idea of peer-to-peer -peer alternatives, uh, for example. The second reason why I think these social innovations are really important is because um, it puts people in the driver's seat. It allows people to invent their own solutions. And therefore, these solutions may be in some ways more lasting uh, than top-down technocratic approaches um, uh, imposed by benevolent uh, administrators who may consult people right, in implementing uh, programs, but do not um, use the imagination of people to come up with their own solutions, uh, sometimes at the very, very local level. Um, what we need, I think, is hybrid forms of governance in which municipalities work with citizens, working with the private sector, to come up with solutions that are suitable to the particular context in which the problem arises, right? For example, Brussels is one of the most um, um, polluted and, and immobile um, cities on earth, and certainly in the EU. Um, what to do about mobility in Brussels? Well, the solutions in Brussels, because of the culture, because they have, we have hills, because people are used or not used to using bicycles, will not be the same solution as in The Hague, in Copenhagen, or in London. And the solutions must be designed in ways that allow people to participate in shaping them so that they understand if effectively the rationale behind the system that is um, then established. Thirdly, these social innovations, it's very striking to me, working with the transition movements, um, allow people to change roles. Um, they will not simply be producers, consumers, whose position is defined by what they do in the division of labor across society. They will have to reinvent themselves. And this means two things. First, it means that people will be able to value each other in ways that are different from their respective roles as producer and consumer. This is important because, uh, as we know from, for example, most recently, the book of François Dubé, uh, La Préférence pour l'inégalité, um, where he shows that people actually have behaviors that mark their difference vis-a-vis -vis others, not least as consumers of material goods, if people assess each other, evaluate each other, value each other in roles other than as producers and consumers, um, they will be less driven by consumption as you know, what gives meaning to their lives and what actually occupies most of their time outside work. Um, so um, I think it's, I mean, we can return to François Dubé and to the question of inequality that he, that he raises, but I think it's important to see that social innovations also allow people to rethink the values that make them move the way they do, that make them behave the way they do, that make uh, the lifestyles uh, they adopt desirable um, in their view. And this actually could prepare the way outside the work-centered society in which other roles are better valued, not least the role of social innovator, in which civic, civic action is rewarded, in which initiatives are built, sometimes at the neighborhood, the street level, the municipality level, um, sometimes at very um, uh, micro levels that nevertheless um, um, can uh, gradually bring about a change. And in fact, this is also why the gender dimension is really important in this discussion as to transitions, because many of these social innovations that are a condition for the ecological transition to succeed are innovations that will lead to value better the um, activities that have traditionally been performed by women and therefore are undervalued. 
such as doing things with neighbors, such as um, buying the right food and cooking it and having family meals. I work a lot on food and I can tell you that for me the most significant threat to our food systems is people do not cook anymore. And I think that is in part because women have taken on cooking for centuries and men have not accepted to take their part in that, in that um, function, which is absolutely vital for our well-being and our health in the future. A fourth reason why these social innovations matter is because it favors participatory democracy, not just representative democracy in which people vote for candidates who then will you know, think for people and impose their solutions, not just participatory democracy in the sense of people being consulted uh, now and then on, on, on certain projects uh, and provide inputs in decision making. No, in these social innovations, people decide. They take their sake in their own hands, they invent their own systems, they invent ways of um, uh, saving uh, uh, energy, of recycling waste, of, of, of feeding themselves better, and they are actually highly imaginative, provided they have this space to invent. Now, how does this relate, and I close with this, to the debate on the future of the EU? I'm sorry if I'm being too long, and I hope this is not the case. Um, look, the debate in the EU today is, is really stuck between two views that are mutually neutralizing each other. One view is that, um, and that is a view of an active minority, that um, we need greater European integration and we need to move towards a federal state. Les États-Unis d'Europe, you know, the Verhofstadt Konbendit uh, view of things, the idea that it's a jump towards the federal state that will represent um, uh, salvation. Um, I am very sympathetic to this view. I unfortunately see today that it is not in the current situation one that has much traction. However, the other view that is proposed is, if anything, even worse. That is the view of a very heterogeneous group of opponents to Europe, whether they are sovereignists uh, nostalgic of a homogeneous uh, nation state, whether they are motivated by the desire to protect social welfare states at the domestic level, which is um, not nicely called national welfare chauvinism, um, um, or uh, those who instead fear a super um, European welfare state, which is, I think, a myth, but which many people um, fear might emerge um, as a result of transferring more powers to Europe. And I think both views, the federalist view and the, shall we say, Eurosceptic view, and there are different uh, versions of that second view, um, both these views essentially have in common the belief that more Europe means more homogeneity, um, less diversity, more top-down approaches, less bottom-up approaches, more technocratic impositions, less room for local national democratic deliberation. And I think that by reinventing European governance based on social innovations that can be replicated from place to place, accelerate collective learning, um, decentralize the search for things that work at the municipal, regional, um, um, state level, um, we may actually uh, contribute to addressing the challenges ahead. Many thanks. Mm -hmm.